Okay, Tim, you're just back from a dialogue with Andrew Cohen. Um, and we were just calling in for a chat, but we thought, uh, well, I'm certainly interested to know how that went. And we think other people might be too. So here's me asking my question I've been waiting to ask. How, how did it go with Andrew? So, Tim, how did it go with Andrew? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, in, in that, I'm normally when I'm doing an event myself, you know, I can feel it out. I know where I want to take it. I know the feeling I want at the end, and pretty much always we get there. Uh, with this, it was different. I was doing it with, with obviously with somebody else. It was a different intention for it, um, and I'm looking forward to looking at the, the footage, which is I hope being edited this week, uh, and trying to get a sense of it myself, and and also to hear what other people said. I mean, I know the people who came, a lot of people came up and said that how good they thought the evening been, how interesting. Uh, I know Andrew, cause he's just emailed me that he enjoyed it. And I certainly enjoyed it and, and found it, found it good. Um, I think that, the, you know, like I said, when we had our conversation about it previously, my, my sense is that I, I had a lot of things I wanted to do. I genuinely wanted to interact with Andrew about this evolutionary philosophy of which he has been a pioneer and we have huge agreement and then a whole load of disagreements. And we kind of launched straight into that because he, he brought up God straight away uh, once we taught evolutionary philosophy. And, and that's probably the one thing he could have focused on where probably where we're coming from is slightly different, although it's quite a nuanced difference really. And so we got into that. I think that was quite interesting. Um, but, and also Andrew, you know, Andrew's a very different Andrew than when I met him, so the first time where he felt very aloof and strong and confident. And, and he, you know, he, he, see, he strikes me as a, as a man who's gone through a very difficult time, not surprisingly. Um, so I find that instinctively my heart reaches out to him because I can see that he has been on this transformatory journey and, and he's been hurt by what's happened to him in his life whether he deserves it or not who cares in that respect you know it's a human being who's who's had shock and trauma and and, and is trying to find their path again in all of that and i was also aware of course i've received all these messages from people who have, have really suffered because of andrew and i wanted to honor that so i wanted to be able to bring that up but but it, it would have been different if i was bringing that up with a guy who was like you know wow someone needs to puncture him uh, but it wasn't it's was like i wanted to support andrew in, in, in as instinctively in my that was because because that's so did that also come up in the dialogue because it, andrew is almost um there's different aspects right there's the the philosophical andrew which is quite interesting and he's had ideas and maybe contributed to this whole consciousness thing with his enlightened next magazine and other things and then there's the the guru andrew where um andrew is in um you know kind of a unique position not you're not unique but um there's a lot of people who have been involved in cults or these kind of movements where they've come out and think, oh yeah, I, on, on the end of being the disciple, on the end of being the person who feels they've yeah. been the victim of the abuse. There's a, a minority of people who have been in the role of the guru at the head of that, yeah. who are the one ended up yeah. being you know, accused of doing all the bad things. Um, and in that sense, someone like Andrew, um, although it raises moral questions about what is his role then in the future, there's also a unique perspective he can bring um, in the, how did this young man who went to see Papaji in India and Papaji confirmed this whole kind of thing about him being this special kind of character, um, where did that lead him then to being in the position where he's been, um, had the spotlight on him and accused of all these, these things and, um, and he can perhaps offer insight in the, maybe, maybe the ego inflation that can go on or the problems yeah. that can arise? Did that come up too? Yes, it did. And I, you know, I brought it up specifically because I, I wanted to home in on the role of the guru and whether the, what, whether the old model based on the view of the ego as a bad thing and the guru's job in confronting it, whether we needed to move on from that. And that had been very, very central, I know, to what Andrew was doing. So I, yeah, I brought that up and he certainly was very thoughtful about it all and it had moved on. I felt, and I, and I did mention this to him through the conversation, that he would drift back into this old e the, the, the standard ego model of this negative thing um he would drift into that almost without noticing it um and so that was still there i f i felt underneath even though that he was he was definitely looking for a new way of of understanding and a new way of honoring what was good you know not wanting to just collapse everything he got but mm -hmm. rightfully 
point of fun anyway. So that was gone on. He had a real sense of humility and apologizing, I felt and other people felt. But also, you know, I wasn't the guy, you know, the things which happened were pretty horrendous. And so uh, we didn't get into that. And I wasn't the right person to, to mm. do that. I, mm. I like can that. see it like being on the uh, other side of the equation, say, of being the, more the devotee or the disciple role in this. Um, those patterns, uh, I was, um, I had that mindset, that like the guru kind of mindset for a very short period of my life and with concepts around attaining enlightenment and things like this. And it always surprises me, given it was a short period, it was also an intense period, and how long they can stick for, right? And there can be, there can be patterns that I still find myself emerging yeah. out of now in my mid-30s, you know? So yeah. um, it doesn't surprise me that uh, there's a drift back there for anyone, and including someone in, in Andrew's position of the, the kind of guru role. Yeah, I don't, know, I don't know what degree he was drifting back into the guru thing, although that might well happen. I, I can't tell. I don't know. I don't know the situation well enough. But I did feel he, his understanding of, you know, and partly he may, and, and, and it may be that he wasn't, you know, for me, he was drifting for him. He just, he may just feel like, well, my understanding of the nature of the ego was limited. You know, that it needed, they needed to focus on this more negative aspect. And, and partly he, and of course there is a negative aspect you can focus on. I mean, there's you no, know, who can't look in themselves and find something negative. So, so it was more to do with that. And, and also I kind of had this feeling afterwards, one thing, you know, I have, a, I have a sense that I will understand it more over the next few days. And I, and I wish I'd said to him publicly and got his response, what you've just said, because in retrospect, it feels like, ah, looks to me, Andrew, like you're going to go back and try and teach awakening again, because that's what you feel called here to do. And it's all gone wrong, but you'd like to come back and do it right. Uh, that has some dangers associated with it, obviously, um, given it went wrong before. But actually, the thing which Andrew could really contribute so beautifully is this unique experience of being the, in the centre and it all collapsing and then trying to come back and do it and do it right. It's a unique perspective. So actually, the awakening to the deep stuff, the deep being, is something which he's obviously done a lot of and is very uh, good at, it seems. But actually teaching about the human stuff. I mean, Karen, who's some of you will know, you may, you know, who's been to many of my retreats and she came and was sitting there and, and it was interesting. She just responded to him at one point going, yeah, the thing that I find really attractive about you though, is, is this human story, which you're sharing and your, your vulnerability. Mm. <laughs> and, 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 and I, you know, it, it would have been actually, that is, I think if you focused in on that, uh, it might actually be really... Yes, it's ironic you know, that Andrew has created a human story which people are interested in. You know? Yeah, yeah. And so I feel like there was like, we skimmed the surface of what could be a, you know, of a huge thing. And I'm sure he's in the middle of the process. I, I mean, he seemed that way to me. He seemed like a man who was midway in, in some big process, actually. I think what it, what it brings up for me when I encounter um, people in Andrew's situation is this unanswerable question of, is it a case of uh, there's some fundamental divide between... Um, me and like I could never have got into the position Andrew got himself into or is it a case of um, but for the grace of God there go I and you know if I'd have gone to India as a young man and some some guru had pointed at me and said you're the one um, could this have led to because I can recognize the kind of sense of ego inflation uh, if I think back to being 18 19 and starting to touch on these transpersonal states and uh, that coming into contact then with a very unhealed unresolved person and how that could yeah lead to the sense that i'm doing something different i'm at the cutting edge of human consciousness all these kind of ego inflation thoughts come in and you know if if uh, there wasn't a wave there for me to ride there was no potential for me to get a movement going but if if that had lined up at that point what kind of extremities of thought and position could i have gone into and i, I find that a bit of a, an unanswerable question but I, it's, it's never too late, Richard. Should we try it now? <laughs> Richard, you're the if one. You, if you can get me lots of power and you're the one authority, to, uh, big audiences, I'll, I'll, I'll do the experiment, yeah. <laughs> uh, look, yeah, really great question. Uh, I, um, my own, there was a moment I actually interrupted Andrew, which I didn't do much. He just came out of my mouth where he was telling the story of his teacher and he said his teacher had said to him, never doubt yourself. And I just found myself just going, wow, that's terrible advice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he was like, well, no wonder you got yourself to a mess. You, you, your teacher was giving you advice that bad. I mean, that is terrible advice. And um, 
dangerous and awful. So, you know, I, I don't know what that was about. So my sense is, my sense is that would it happen to anyone? Probably not. I think it, it was certain, you know, I, I seem more, I would suggest I'm probably more susceptible to the uh, follower psychosis. You know, I, mm. I've done that with my guru and then I did that with another young person I followed when I was very young and set them up and wanted them to be elevated and was happy to do that um, and then came through that. Maybe because I had that experience, I was determined not to put anyone else in that situation. But there's also, you know, to get actually to... It's, what, one, of the, one of the thoughts that we it came up right at the end of our the, the end of the talk bit before we did question and answers you'll see is it suddenly dawned on me how interesting that we were here talking about abuse in the power of relationship with the guru and the student but that actually the whole of society is convulsing at the moment with issues of power abuse and in in relationship to men and women and just more generally you know just like the what is and isn't okay and it's a, what is that relationship of power when people have power what how should they handle it and so it feels like it's it's actually a general thing as well as a specific thing. yeah and i i, I don't know I, i've never felt any danger of it but i mean you know likewise i haven't said i haven't had Anyone put me in that position, I suppose. Yeah, I don't know if there's the same sense of shock when you find a politician is abusing power, right? Because why wouldn't they? They're politicians. But when there's someone in a spiritual field, there's the expectation that, you know, you, you're becoming one with the universe, but you're not even beyond abusing personal power. You know, there's that. I'm not saying that's a correct perception to have, but it's, it's yeah, and, surprising and in a way it isn't in other areas. That's, that's the area which, uh, I mean, I think the more, you know, if someone's a politician, we feel worse about them than if they were a plumber, um, because there's a sense of you should be, you know, you're making the laws, you should, and in, in a way I kind of get that, and, and with the spirituality, it's even more so, because it's like, well, you're, you're taking care of the soul, yeah. um, and, and that's kind of right, but also Andrew did touch on a number of times this idea of the mythic perception of the teacher, and, and being what he got caught up into. And I think that's probably right. That the, the, that's it, that the guru model is coming from a mythic mindset and sets up, therefore, that the guru represents God and embodies God, and, and no one can handle that. Everyone is human. Everyone is human, and and therefore everyone's on a journey. And we we all have different things which we can bring, and different things where we can fall down, and we need to see that in each other. That's why, to me. The model we need to give to each other is now of ah look this is deep oneness which we can access and there's our vulnerable humanity and that was that was the reason i did the did the event with andrew was to just see whether i could articulate it with him in conversation and and how that would go and i thought it went pretty well actually in that respect okay great well i think the um it was recorded wasn't it it was filmed yeah yeah and and i'm hoping it's going to be edited and available really soon. I mean, it was a long event. We we had it was two and a half hours, three hours. Wow! Um, right. With a you know break, um, but yeah, we 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 tried to use the time as best we could. Um, and I, I I will just be fascinated to see people's response. Whether it, it touched on things they find interesting, um, I'm hoping that the people who contacted me saying they felt abused or not felt abused, or <laughs> clearly had been abused. abused. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and I feel like I was able to uh, at least acknowledge that. I can't represent that. I'm not in the position to, to do that, but I, can, I didn't want to ignore that. Um, and I was not there to hold him to account or anything. But I did want to, to also see if we could create something which was a genuine conversation in which something valuable could be learned generally about how we take spirituality forward. Sure. Because if, if Andrew was an aberration of what happened there, then okay, maybe we could just forget it. But it's been consistent yeah, it's across the spiritual board. Yeah. You know, it's <laughs> just across ubiquitous. the world. But yeah, yeah so it, it, it is ubiquitous. We do need to understand uh, what goes wrong in these situations and, as and clearly as possible. What you said, Richard, you know, it's like the more power, the more open to abuse. So if someone's, you know, in the, in the film industry, if someone's right at the top of the tree, then they can be abusive and a bully, for instance, but also in politics and also in spirituality. If you're being seen as the oracle with all the infallible knowledge and wisdom on everything, then, you know, you are in a position to, to abuse that terribly. 
so that and, and it does seem to happen so much maybe because if you weren't prone to that you wouldn't allow yourself to be put in that position you just stop it i mean yeah i, 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 just, don't, a... I just don't want it i mean it just looks like a horrible place to be I can see that in terms of relationships, individual relationships or group relationships that I had 15 years ago, uh, I wouldn't have the same relationships now because I would uh, want different things and I would tolerate different things, okay, and not tolerate different things. And yeah, I can see that um, in groups I was involved in, where, well, no, I was never involved in an abusive group, but in groups where things were you know, not 100% uh, great, there was also an, an attraction there and something that kept me hooked in. Yeah. And I think it's, it's hopefully a model that um, we can en masse move out of. But I think that has to be recognized too, that there is a lot of an attraction to um, a guru figure sometimes or an authority figure. And that's what the psyche needs in some way. Uh, in the same way, we can be attracted to relationships um, that can be codependent or something because that's what we're, we're craving, that level of confirmation of ourselves. Um, so I think that has to be taken into account too if we're looking to create a more healthy model yeah, because the big thing is the giving of power, and that did come up, is that you know, I know from when I went in, I was very young, but when I entered a guru relationship, I, it's a bit like an addiction. If I look back to when I became a cigarette addict, I didn't like smoking the first cigarettes. I had to stick at it long yeah. enough to get into it. Um, and I did, and I did get into it, and I became an addict. And it felt a bit like when I first saw my guru, I just went, this guy is not to be trusted and is ripping everyone off. But I actually kept going long enough to get through that yeah. <laughs> until, I, until I fell in love with him. And then it took me a while before I got back to the place when, oh, oh no, 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 the, the first perception had something in it. And hopefully this kind of, as time goes by, this bottleneck or this pyramid will change as well. And that Andrew is one of the, you know, the early Westerners to go out to India. And that alone makes him special and people who did that at that time special. Um, and the ones that came back and could articulate that were, you know, the first Westerners to be... Uh, speaking about this Eastern philosophy, um, and when you've got a very small number of people like that, they take on a, a certain specialness, a certain limited supply. And I think as it, this philosophy becomes more common in society and more distributed, um, the specialness of the teacher uh, might just fall away. You're not going to get another Sai Baba with 100 million followers in the same way. Well, maybe, maybe. Well, in India, maybe. But, um... Maybe in India. I, I, you know, I just thought of something while you were saying that, which related back to your previous point in my life. And I thought, actually, you know, I never had the, I never had the, because I was thinking what happened to, to Andrew, what he was describing was he started speaking and teaching and then people started lighting up and were having experiences. And, and so he found himself surrounded by people and, and it's, it just took off. And whilst I didn't have that exactly when I was younger and his age, for sure, what I did have was if I think back to my early life now, I was a, a devotee of the guru, of my guru, and I was totally in, in, you know, devoted. But I also, because I'm very good at speaking and persuasive and good with words, I, would, I was very good at introducing this to other people. And I did. And lots and lots of people got involved on the basis of meeting me. Uh, and then I left and a whole load of people are still involved <laughs> now. <laughs> and I look back and think, oh God, you know, I, I'm not, you know, from my perspective now, I'm, I'm not particularly proud of that. Um, also, another point in my life, which I've talked about a little bit, you know, I became a Marxist. I was a member of a Trotskyist group in, in politics when I, was, when I was young, like very early 20s, for whatever it was, two years or something. And again, I just thought these ideas were beautiful because they were going to lead to a utopia and it was like, uh, it was, I thought it was visionary. And I would share it with other people. And, and because I'm very good at that, a lot of people joined. And uh, some of them are still members. <laughs> and I look back and I think, oh God, you know, it's like, oh. And so I think that has really shaped me. So where I had that situation and I saw, I have a power here and that's why, part, I think it's partly why I've never set up the Deep Awake thing as some big organization with me at the top. It's because I really don't want, I really want people to keep their autonomy and not be swayed mm. by a charismatic person, me or anyone else. Well, I want them to also the, um, the Deep Awake events and when it was called the Mystery Experience, it's about 
this event and the event and the collective coming together is what causes the transformation. You've never set it up around satsang of Tim Freak, where come and sit in the presence of Tim Freak's consciousness and that will awaken you, which is obviously what all the teachers do. Um, yeah, and that and maybe it's not a good marketing strategy. I don't know. Maybe, you know, but uh, it, it's I'm probably sure, healthier uh, overall. <laughs> I, yeah, it's certainly not a good marketing sp- strategy because, um, you know, considering the, the power uh, that what we've been doing for 20 years, this is tiny, tiny, tiny compared mm. to what other people are doing. Yeah, um, compared to the, the guru kind of phenomenon yeah, and teachers definitely. that have gone down that road. Definitely. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm sure yeah. if I set myself up and went, and that is the question isn't it i think the someone um not andrew per se but someone in in his position what it can trigger in me is the sense of there's someone who has had no problem taking power right and having this big organization and um leading it and all the rest and i scratch around with my little thing going on and trying to fill a very small room half full um and you know obviously have more issues around around power like that and i think that can be um, the triggering thing. And some that's what speaks to the shadow in me, if you like, of my not accepting that. And I think the, um, another, another factor of integration then for the, the future of this, uh, of this movement um, is looking at how to have that, how to uh, sell, not in a financial sense, but to get people to, you know, come along to stuff that isn't based around satsang of a guru. Um, to, yeah. Yeah, it needs a whole shift, and I, that I I feel quietly confident that shift will happen. Mm. Uh, but but when, you know, and but it's also you know that's the great paradox always, isn't it? Because because someone like Andrew was willing to do to take that on, he did achieve a lot. He had a yeah. mag- magazine, huge magazine, made a big impact. You know, it, the, the positive side of it was great. It just there was this other side which was really really not. And I, part of the reason I think I don't get myself involved anyway, you know, that doesn't happen around me is, is because I don't want the responsibility. I, I, you know, if, I, if I had uh, people saying that I had completely messed up their lives and I looked at the things I did and was like horrified, because some of the things are horrifying, yeah. I would, it would be just so You're crawling under a rock, yeah. <laughs> you know, just to live with it. Um, yeah. And I can see that, 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 that I think there's been a great revelation for Andrew. And I think he, t- he did talk about wanting to crawl under a rock and that he was tr- you know, trying to avoid doing that because he felt, felt he wanted to hang on to that original impulse, which was a good one. And, and, I, and I think that's why I was glad to speak with him wherever it goes. Um, I could see sure. that there was, there, was something, there was something good as well. And if there hadn't been something good, then the good things that came out of it wouldn't have happened. There was obviously something that wasn't, wasn't right as well. But, yeah okay well thanks for that tim um i think people will uh, people have a range of opinions on this of whether andrew is cynically trying to reinvent himself or whether it's a genuine repentance and um uh, certainly welcome people's comments no, on uh, that only andrew can tell that i guess yeah sure sure so the um the dialogue will be out soon and this is just a, a warm-up so yeah. i want to get tim sort and i hope uh, yeah it's insightful for people out there thanks thanks very much tim good